The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Assalamu alaikum. Hello and welcome to all of you in today's session on Benami Transactions Prohibition Rules. This is in continuation of our last session on Benami Transactions Prohibition Act 2017. Um, just bear with me for a second. Let me turn on my cam so you guys can see me as well. I hope you can all see me now. Okay, let's proceed. So today's session on the rules basically form the essential part of the Benami Transaction Prohibition Act's practicality. We covered that in the last session and did mention about the rules uh, which are to be covered in today's session. So first things first, uh, a warm welcome to all of you in today's session on behalf of uh, the entire team. Uh, ACC has organized this CPD to ensure that during these times you can invest on, in yourselves, keep yourself up to date, and especially in this important arena that's been constantly mentioned by our members uh, regarding the local laws and taxation, we can work to actually enhance your skills. Is my voice quality fine? Nizam, can you hear me clearly? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Pardon? Sound audio is perfectly clear. Okay, just bear with me for a sec. Let me adjust the fan settings. Okay, guys, uh, back with you. First things first, let's begin with the, the formal intro. Uh, by now, as a result of you attending various CPDs and more so the current ongoing CPD program, uh, I'm sure many of you would already be aware uh, of my introduction, but still, for those who are attending for the first time, I will briefly introduce myself. Bismillah Rahman Rahim, Rabbash Rahli Sadri, Wa Yasserli Amri, Wa Ahluk Tatimil Lesani, Yafka Hu Kauli. O Allah, open my heart and ease my task for me and remove the impediments from my speech so that they may understand what I say. My name is Omar Zahir Mir. I'm honored to be the chair of ACCS MNP and Taxation Subcommittee. I also sit on the editorial board of ACCA's regional pe uh, publication, Policy Insights, for the entire Middle East and South Asia region. I'm also part of several other initiatives of ACCA, including the Professional Experts Forum, the Mentors Group, at, uh, the Six Digit Program, etc. I'm also honored to be representing Pakistan on the Global Tax Forum, too. Um, in addition to this, I'm a life member, twice serving current chairman of Finance and Economic Affairs Liaison Committee of Lahore Tax Bar, and previously have served four time as the chairman of the Liaison Committee of the same. Uh, I'm also honored to be sitting on the board of several think tanks and corporate entities. Um, I'm a fellow chartered certified accountant, CFA charter holder, uh, chartered accountant, BFP, CPFA, with any anti-money laundering, fraud risk management specialization, and several other certifications. Uh, professionally, uh, have 17 years plus fund of experience gained by working in top management positions, both abroad as well as in Pakistan. Presently, in addition to sitting on the board of several corporate entities, I'm mainly the managing partner for taxation and corporate services at Millennium Law and Corporate Company, MLCC, which happens to be the pioneer ACC practicing and law firm in Pakistan. My portfolio as a trainer includes having conducted mandatory promotional trainings of government officers at MPDD, professional trainings at the likes of uh, National Bank of Pakistan, HPLM, CBP, PCBL, Lahore Karachi Tax Bar, Pakistan Tax Bar, Lahore Karachi Chambers, IBP in collaboration with the State Bank of Pakistan, Barrier University, UET, last but not the least, are very on ACCA. And I'm also a regular contributor uh, with my articles being published in various English language dailies on these technical subjects, uh, which you can always um, find on my blog site, umazahirmir.wordpress.com. So that's pretty much about me. Let's move forward. Uh, 
I'm going to skip the next few slides showing the existing clients association listing of academic professional qualifications and major strengths as well as MLCC's intro. Um, uh, but do check out this link in the presentation that you'll be getting. Uh, this is something uh, we are very humbled by and something that can serve as a huge motivating factor for you guys. Um, our firm MLCC was profiled by ACCA and it was published uh, a report on it was published so do have a look on this and uh, if you are planning to come into practice and need any guidance feel free to contact professional acknowledgement several legislations and other reports of the fpr and mlcc uh, have been used in the development of today's presentation due to limited time and the extensive volume of the topic we'll strive to cover the maximum possible content within the available time However, if needed, the content coverage will be prioritized to suit the requirement and constraints of today's sessions. Okay, guys, so Benami Transaction Prohibition Rules 2019. Before we proceed, in the last session and previously in some sessions, we have discussed the relationship of the act or ordinance with the rules. So, why not have some feedback from our learned attendees today? What do you guys think is the relationship of rules with regard to the main body of the law? Why do we even need the rules and what purpose do they serve? Uh, you can type your feedback in the Q&A box or the chat box that you have in the relevant panel. So Rashid Hanif, your name is still appearing as Radid Hanif, but I remembered you. So I do remember your name is Rashid. In the next registration, just be careful. I just sort this out. Uh, so Rashid is saying rules are also a type of a law or something like that. Okay. Nizam. <laughs> Your domain, my friend. Please read all the comments and the name of our learned participants. Okay, Rashid Hanif, rules are also a type of a law or something like that. Uh, Hafiz Muhammad Faisal, rules define execution and ordinance or act are general laws. Mm -hmm. uh, Amna Sami. Rules are the detailed procedures available, practical implication, implementation of the act. Mm -hmm. Adil Nasir, for practical understanding of the ordinance, rules have to be understood. Rao Ali Zishan, laws are the ideals and proclamations in principle. Rules are the nut and bolts, and the steps for executions. Mohammed okay, Ali Sami. Very interesting example. Please carry on. Me rules provide practical steps in order to implement law. Uh, Sakib, Muhammad Sakib, how to comment? You are already commenting, my friend. Uh, <laughs> Sakib, just like Ashir. you write, uh, hang on. Sakib, just like you wrote how to comment, you can just write your comment there. Ask your question there or give your feedback there. Please carry on. Rashid Hanif, rules are details detailed description of any ordinance or act thank That's you all uh, moments okay uh sakibali rush the rules are the procedure of laws to be implemented and uh, saad bin khalid rules are sops for implementation of acts okay the good thing is many of our members uh, especially those who attended the last session have retained uh, and have a good concept of what rules are for, which is fantastic. Yes, rules shows the practical implica implications. And I gave an example last time, citing that it's not uh, like for like, and um, it's not even remotely similar, but because uh, we belong, most of the attendees belong from a certain culture. So things are better understood in the cultural context. And then I gave you uh, the example of the injunctions in the holy quran and then their elaboration in the hadith so um, it's nothing similar again a disclaimer but just only for the purpose of understanding the concept 
the main law only give you the law the injunction and the rules tell you how to go about the practicalities and the modalities how the things would actually work so let's go back to our presentation uh, and by the way while i'm gonna be continuing with the presentation please download the benami prohibition rules 2019 that have been provided in the handout section and the copy of today's presentation you would need to refer to them if you have any problem just type in your chat box and uh, our support team would be happy to provide you the links for the direct download but please open them at your end so you'll be comfortable referring to what i'll be talking still i'll be opening the uh, prohibition rules myself on the screen while sharing with you so that should still be comfortable for you anyway the benami transactions prohibition rules were introduced on 11th march 2019 so almost two years after the act came into force the rules were introduced and these rules were enforced with immediate effect so the practical modalities started happening on the 11th of march 2019 and what happened practically was that um, FPR's Inland Revenue Service uh, tasked the BTB broadening of text-based zones uh, with the duty to investigate and thereafter establish cases regarding Benami properties. And the aim was that this should lead to the submission of chalans to the adjudication authority within 120 days. We have previously read about having 90 days period after the show cause notice um, and then the further 30 days period. So the total time period for submission of Chalan to the adjudication authority is 120 working days. So during this period, the sale, purchase and transfer of property will normally be stopped till further orders. Appeal against any adverse decision of the adjudication authority can be lodged with the federal tribunal. <laughs> excuse me and after the decision of the federal tribunal such properties will be confiscated pay attention and sold out by the federal government furthermore if the crime of benami transactions is proved the confiscation is not all we have read about this and discussed about this in the last session when i say yesterday that refers to the previous session so we discussed there that there are three pronged punishments to say the least uh, the confiscation of the property the imposition of the fine and the prosecution with possible jail terms so that's exactly what's been referred here so furthermore if the crime of penami transaction is proved criminal proceedings will be initiated against accused persons and where proven guilty rigorous imprisonment of one year to seven years can be awarded to such person and remember we also discussed in the session on the Benami Transaction Prohibition Act, that similarly any person providing false and baseless information can also be sentenced to rigorous imprisonment of six months to five years. So, another thing that we briefly referred to in the Act session, and which we, you should keep in mind, is that uh, the concept of whistleblowers was introduced. I believe being qualified professionals, chartered, certified accountant, you'll all be aware of what a whistleblower is. So let those comments come in. Let me see what you guys think. I'll be giving you guys about a minute to type in your responses. Nobody knows what whistleblower is. How to comment? Sakib Sahab, you can comment the same way you are already doing, where you are typing how to comment. That's exactly where you'll type in your comment. Okay, guys, I'll wait 10 more seconds and then I'll answer this myself, assuming that all our learned participants, unfortunately, do not know what a whistleblower is. Okay, someone is typing. 
So let's see. Uh, you need to be quick because it's a time constraint session, so we can't law wait for much longer. Okay, so I'll just continue. Um, a whistleblower is basically someone who tips off about some wrongdoing. So um, in this regard about the Benami that we are talking about, in this context, the whistleblowers will be rewarded, will be entitled to a cash reward for providing credible information leading to detection and confiscation of a Benami property or transaction. So the uh, benefit normally is about 5%. So if a property is worth uh, 2 million or less, 5% of the price of the Benami will be given to the informer. If the property is worth more than 2 million, then it would come down to 4%. That would be given to the informer. And where the value is more than 5 million, only 3% would be given. But think about it. If it's like um, a property, an average property in a good location, um, Mm, three to five crores so that means three crore into three percent do the maths there you go not bad anyway uh, there are some conditions number one it is clarified that this award will be given only if the information provided is of value and fbr doesn't already have it if they already have it no sorry you don't qualify if they don't have it but it doesn't lead somewhere sorry hard luck and if the information is already in public record sorry hard luck and um, if the appeal against confiscation of property doesn't attain finality or goes against the department sorry hard luck so it's only after they have actually confiscated the property and the decision has attained finality and the information was not already with them the information was not in public record and um, the information was actually valuable leading to the prosecution and the finality or FPR's decision only then you'll get the reward anyway the reward is just to encourage uh, being a good Samaritan a responsible citizen we should all be able to report anyway so let's start with the actual act Benami tra uh, actual rules Benami transaction prohibition rules I've also opened up the act and the income tax ordinance because there are some cross references and I would like to show you those as well. So let's start with the rules now. Excuse me. So as you can see the date on the rules um, document that's been shared with you as a PDF file is 11th of March 2019. It was issued by the Revenue Division, Federal Board of Revenue of Government of Pakistan. And the SRO number is SRO 3261 of 2019. In exercise of the powers conferred by Section 61 of the Benami Transaction Prohibition Act 27, Number five of 2017, the government, the federal government is pleased to make the following rules. Uh, you would have seen this uh, when we go through various legislation that there is always cross reference. This is a basic thing. Section 61 basically allowed uh, the federal government to make rules. The parliament gave that power to the federal government to make the relevant rule for this relevant legislation. But let me just quickly show you the section 61. This is the act. I told you I've opened it because there are some cross references and I wanted you to see how they can actually be cross reference and uh, just find out even if you have missed the previous session that what we are talking about. So here comes the section 61. And it simply states that the federal government may by notification in the official gazette make rules for carrying out the provisions of this act so the purpose the authority vested with who and the process to make the rules has all been mentioned and followed so this is the official gazette in which the government of pakistan notified 
so section uh, section one of the rules state simply the introduction that is normally the case with any body of legislative document it says short title and commencement these rules shall be called the benami transaction prohibition rules 2019 and come into force at once which means the date on this which this was issued so the rules came into force on 11th march 2019 now before we proceed i have a very very interesting question for you we are aware that the act was promulgated in 2017 and the rule only became relevant uh, sorry available they were all they will always be relevant unless superseded um they only became public and were uh, notified in 2019 so the question is that the act mentioned that the uh, benami cases uh, would fall within the purview of the act from the date on or after the date of the commencement of the act whereas the rules only came into being into in 2019 so now my question is can the benami questions uh, cases uh, since commencement of the benami transaction prohibition act 2017 be covered within the benami transaction prohibition rules 2019 and you simply have to answer that via the poll that is now appearing on your screen and you can select one of the two options yes or no and your time starts now i'll give you about 2 minutes to answer this poll okay very good we have started getting votes okay quick many people are saying yes but we have a good number saying no 13% 20% okay it's getting interesting and closer then the beginning and the demographic is constantly changing now about 27% are saying no and 73 yes okay carry on guys you still have 1 minute 20 seconds keep those uh, responses coming okay we have reached about 50 Eight seconds, and it's almost seventy-four to twenty. Okay. Nizam, the total is going haywire. I think that's a rounding error. Uh, maybe, sir. Okay, guys. Last thirty-five seconds remaining. come on guys come on the yes uh, group is winning at the moment they have casted 74% votes in favor of yes okay and uh, while we are getting additional votes it's largely staying the same come on guys vote you have your time last few seconds and then we'll close the poll and 5 4 3 2 1 and it's up so the poll results are um i think there is a rounding error because it's showing 76% as yes and 27 as no and that would go up to 103 so we can um, roughly say that about uh, 75% said yes and 25% said no <clears throat> okay the 25% who said no might have said that since the rules were not into being how can the cases attract them but remember the rules derived their applicability from the act and the act came into being in 2017 so any cases on or after the date of 2017 would still be liable to the legal purview so congratulations to the people who voted yes uh, because they voted correctly and congratulations still to the people who voted no why the answer was not correct because they got to learn something new and hopefully they would not forget this now so let's go back to the main body of the rules that we were discussing section 2 as normally is the case in many legislation drafts deal with the definitions it says that in this in these rules unless there is anything repugnant in the subject or context the act would mean 
a reference to the Benami Transaction Prohibition Act 2017, which is very common sense, uh, very much a matter of common sense. Chapter would mean a chapter of the act, section would mean a section of the act. It's all common sense, but law doesn't believe in only common sense. It wants to have everything written down in black and white. So words and expressions used but not defined in these rules shall have the same meaning as assigned thereto in the Trusts Act 1882, Succession Act 1925, Partnership Act 1932, Income Tax Ordinance 2001, Anti-Money Laundering Act 2010, and the Companies Act 2017. So, um, the rules might have terms which have been taken from these legislations but not defined herein and they would have the meaning that's been given to them in their respective original legislation drafts as being referred to here section 3 of the rules deals with the jurisdiction of administrator initiating officer and approving authority under subsection 2 of section 15 and this is being referred to the relevant sections of the Benami Transaction Prohibition Act, which I've shown you already and a copy of which you would have. If you don't, send me a message on LinkedIn and I'll share that with you guys. Okay, guys, uh, this is very important because uh, now these modalities at times come really handy. If the authorities haven't uh, acted as per their actual jurisdiction, the entire matter can go haywire on technical grounds. So it is imperative that you pay attention and are aware of these modalities. So the board may, uh, subsection one of section three states, the board may by an order assign any commissioner in land revenue to exercise the powers and perform the functions of approving authority under the provisions of this uh, act of the act and the rules. Subsection 2 states that the board may by an order also can assign obviously any deputy commissioner in land revenue to exercise the powers and perform the functions of initiating officers under the provisions of the act and these rules. If you remember in the last session, I did tell you that the approving authority would be the commissioner normally and the uh, IO initiating officer. It's not the criminal or civil investigation officer, sorry, uh, criminals. Um, it is IU, same abbreviation, but herein the IU means the initiating officer. And as I mentioned to you in the last session, it would normally be the deputy commissioner by virtue of board's authority. The board may also by an order assign any assistant commissioner to exercise the powers and perform the functions of the administrator who would administer the property should the need arise. Section four, determination of price in certain cases. So you have to determine the price of a property or the transaction in dispute. Uh, it can be a movable or immovable property. Uh, we are certainly, when we are referring to the transaction or the property, we are referring to the Benami one. Don't lose sight of the context, what we are discussing here. Determination of price in certain cases, subsection one states, that for the purpose or purposes of sub clause B of clause 15 of section 2, the price that is a reference to the main act. The price shall be determined in accordance with the provisions of section 68 of the income tax ordinance and rules made there under to the extent applicable under the act. Now you can see how the rules are referring to the main body of the law, which is the act. It is constantly referring to the sections of the act. And I've already shown you how you can cross effort to income tax ordinance. But since determination of price is such a critical element, and I believe till now we are right on track in terms of time, I'll just quickly show you what we are talking about. So uh, section four of the rules has stated that the price determination shall be in accordance with the provision of section 68. So let's have a look at the section 68 of the income tax ordinance. So section 68 deals with the fair market value and that's on page 118, which should be roughly around 142. There you go. Section 68 fair market value. Now remember, this forms an essential part of determining the values under the legislation that we just referred to. So while this is from the income tax ordinance, 
now it forms a part of the relevant rules because it's been referred to here as such so um, in essence basically for the purposes of this ordinance fair market value of any property rent asset service benefit or perquisite at a particular point in time shall be the price which the property rent asset service benefit or perquisite no surprise for qualified accountants would ordinarily fetch on sale or supply in the open market at that time and if you can recall this is exactly the definition you have been studying throughout your lives of an arm's length transaction which is the fair market value the far uh, the fair market value of any property or rent asset service benefit or perquisite shall be determined without regards to any restriction on transfer or to the fact that it is not otherwise convertible to cash if there is any restriction you'll assume there is no restriction and what would be the fair market value then and that would be the value that would be the deemed value in case of a benami transaction or property where the price other than the price of an immovable property referred to in subsection one is not ordinarily ascertainable such price may be determined by the commissioner if there is no way no fpr value no market value then the commissioner has the discretionary power to determine the price and they can write down that under what mechanism they have determined it notwithstanding anything contained in subsections one and three the board may from time to time by notification in the official gazette determine the fair market value of immovable property of the area or areas as may be specified in the notification so this is a reference to the fpr values where the fair market value of any immovable property of an area or areas has not been determined by the board in the notification referred to in subsection 4 that we just discussed the fair market value of such immovable property shall be deemed to be the fixed value the value fixed by the dc district officer revenue or provincial or any other authority in this behalf for the purpose of stamp duty so you can safely say if you don't have the fair market value the fpr value then you'll resort to the dc value or uh, the values notified for the purposes of stamp duty in respect of immovable property um, okay this is just uh, a formula it forms the essentials anyway you have seen more of or less uh, how to determine the fair market values so i'll revert back to the rules now and before we talk about appointment of chairpersons and members for it uh, of the adjudicating authority now is a good time to take your questions you'll have about 30 seconds to start typing in your questions and i'll answer them meanwhile you can see nizam if we already have any question that's not been answered you can read them uh, Fawad has mentioned that he missed uh, the last session. Don't worry, Fawad, you'll receive quarterly email um, about all the sessions that are being done. And there's also another way you can uh, uh, actually uh, make use of this uh, resource. Basically, the aim has been to allow you to develop your skills, your professional abilities, and yourselves during these uh, uncertain and very rare uh, times that we are currently going through of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, on a sideline, we hope that you are taking all the necessary precautions and staying home unless uh, necessary. And even if going out for a necessity, taking all necessary precautions. So the aim has been to allow you to have this uh, facility to convert this uh, pandemic, the free time that you certainly find uh at your disposal convert that into a blessing by uh, providing you all these resources so in lieu of this uh, um, recordings of these sessions as well as other cpds would also be available on my social media channels uh, mostly people prefer to use youtube so you can go on youtube and you can just type in my name umar zahir meer and you can see all the videos there they are available to you uh, you can uh, go to them um, if you have missed any session you can actually uh, uh, catch up on that if you want to look at uh, the training for maybe another session you can look at that 
Uh, similarly, ACC also has a channel at YouTube, but now the recordings of these channels, to my knowledge, are not uploaded there. They are instead uploaded at a different platform, which would also be shared with you. So if you are more comfortable with that, you can avail that. If you are comfortable with YouTube or you are in a rush, you want it more quickly, uh, in a few days time you can go uh, subscribe to the channel and I would say one thing don't just keep it to yourself spread it in your circle knowledge is a blessing share it with your colleagues with your friends everyone let everyone help develop their professional skills so together we can give back to the profession and the wider society at large um, if you have any query even after the session you can engage with me on social media the best way to reach me is on linkedin i'll be sharing my contact details though so do we have any questions by now oh, we have a few questions sir okay, uh, the first one being from mohammed wasim akhtar Mm -hmm. uh, who should we report these frauds to if your line manager is involved as well? FPR. You will go find out the relevant uh, officer at uh, FPR. Better to disclose them and meet them in person first rather than uh, just sending simply a letter to them. Next one. Mohammed Saqib Rafiq, how will it be uh, ascertained that FPR did not have that information which was whistleblowed? Okay, that's a good question. Uh, Wasim, it's our national duty. Being a good citizen, we should be doing it anyway. Whistleblowing incentive is just what the name says, an incentive. However, to answer your question, the FPR will tell you that and um, normally it would be tougher for them not to say the right thing because everything needs to be documented i'm not saying there are not ways to get around that but um, that's the process at the moment and we should hope that especially with the younger professional lot coming in uh, the things are changing at the various national institutions including the text man hope that answers the question next one Rashid Hanif, sir, actually, who make these rules, Federal Government Revenue Division or FPR? Well, uh, the purview is with the Federal Government and Revenue Division is a division of the Government of Pakistan. And FPR is a department within that uh, division. So it is like you have a company, ABC Private Limited, and ABC Private Limited has Division A, which has had Department X. So when a department X releases something, who has released that? Obviously your division and the company both, department X is a part of them. And the company asked the division to ask department X to do that. Make sense? Great, next one. Uh, Hussain, Rashid, hang Hadi. on, hang on. Rashid, don't be so gloomy. Uh, it actually brought, um, smile to my face after listening to my answer about who uh, uh, the whistleblower thing rashid said so in other words no rewards i would say to you and reward or no reward do your national duty though i'll hope that you'll be getting some rewards next uh, Hussain hadi i would like to ask if a person buys uh, the property due to uh, any reason register the property to his family members can it cover in benami property a beneficiary of uh, the asset is someone else who had purchased the property and had its documents uh what was the name of the person who asked the question hussein hadi hussein sub uh, it's a very good question um i think but I think perhaps you missed out the last session, but don't worry inshallah the recording will be available on the YouTube channel next week And in fact a new video is being made public on it every day. So go check it out uh, This question was discussed extensively um, 
we have a limited time today but i'll try to do one thing if at the end of the session we still have some time left just remind me about your question and i'll answer this again but otherwise you can see the recording of the last session unfortunately you won't be able to ask live questions there but these questions have been answered there so you'll get a good idea plus your knowledge of the entire act would be updated as well even after watching the session uh, recording, if you feel you need to consult or get some guidance, send me a message on my LinkedIn and I'll be more than happy to answer you. It might be that I might not immediately respond because I'm busy with so many things, but I make an effort to reply each and every one. Sometimes the load is a lot and one or two message might get buried, but send me a reminder and I will get back to you. Next one. Mohammed Ijaz, uh, Benami Transactions Prohibition Rules 2017 will only be apl applicable within Pakistan. What about the properties abroad? Well, Pakistan only has jurisdiction in Pakistan. Na? For property abroad, we have different set of rules. We have Anti-Money Laundering Act. Uh, we have collaborations with other countries. We have FATF. We have International Watchdogs. We have a NAB that's functioning there are many platforms for there next one rao ali zishan uh, have a, has a input for us uh, one can approach the fpr intelligence department uh, rather than going to find the cid slash dcit where no reference has been filed yet uh, you can approach the FBR intelligence department, but a separate department has been created out of the BTB officers and FBR claims that these are some of their best officers uh, that were available and at their disposal. So these are the officers who would actually be investigating. So I think uh, a more practical approach would be meet the officer too. And when you share with the officer, a copy should be served to FPR intelligence too. So you cover both the theoretical and the practical basis. Hope that answers the question. And thanks for the addition, Rob. Next one. Um, Babar Ali, if a person having a lot of lots and shops with heavy value, but is his income is too low uh, and not matched with his assets, a person is non-filer, whether this will be considered as Benami property? Uh, what you have described alone would not it would fall under section triple one undisclosed uh, income and asset rules would apply on it and uh, there are serious repercussions for it these can still be benami depending on whether they meet the conditions as described in the benami transaction prohibitions act if you want to discuss something specific i don't think this is appropriate forum uh, neither due to time restriction and because we have to take everyone together and the topic we have to stay relevant, but also for confidentiality. So again, approach me on my LinkedIn profile, send me a direct message there, and I'll respond to you. Next one. So those will be all for now. Fantastic. So we have answered all the relevant questions, uh, which is pretty good. And it means that we can go back to our presentation okay so let's continue from where we left off subsection 5 uh, subsection uh, uh, no no we have already covered subsection 1 of section 4 section 5 appointment of chairperson and members of adjudicating authority secretary revenue division shall forward to the federal government a panel of suitable officers who are qualified as per criteria provided for in subsection 3 of section 6 now which section is this we are only in section 5 so which section can this be act or here the rules come on guys think section 6 does not have any subsection 3 it is referring to the main legislation of benami transaction prohibition act and if you attended the last session you could remember that let me show you too this is the benami transaction prohibition act and this is section 6 and you can see that subsection 3 of section 6 mentions the qualifications for the relevant position 
to be a chairperson or member of the adjudicating authority so in line with these requirements somebody who qualify as per these and is an officer of the federal board of revenue uh, their names would be forwarded by the secretary revenue division to the federal government for approval and the federal government shall then notify them appoint them and from amongst that panel the federal government shall appoint one chairperson and as many members as it deem fit for the adjudicating authority so section 6 deals with the terms and conditions of the service of the chairpersons and members of the adjudicating authority will also be discussing that what would happen if uh, somebody resigns or if the number is not complete uh, due to these technicalities would the proceedings be deemed null and void or the proceedings would retain uh, their sanctity let's find out so first things first for the purposes of subsection 1 of section 10 the chairperson and members of the adjudicating authority shall respectively be entitled to the pay allowances and other balance uh, benefits as mentioned here so everything is uh, being made quite transparent the chairperson would have pay allowances and other benefit as admissible prior to his appointment under rule 5 of the pay allowances and other benefits admissible immediately before his retirement and in addition to that pay allowance and benefit that officer was already receiving they would get an additional monthly adjudicating authority allowance of 300000 so if somebody was previously getting uh, say um, 3 lakh 4 lakh something like this whatever then they'll start getting an additional 3 lakh they would still get their old package and this by virtue of being appointed on this position and the members in addition to their previous pay allowances would receive a monthly adjudicating authority allowance of 200,000 so basically they have tried to make this as lucrative as possible while remembering the services rules uh, to ensure that people uh, would focus on their work and uh, would feel that their financial needs are properly taken care of section 7 deals with the provisional attachment um, in the act we have discussed that the investigating officer uh, can forward to the officer uh, their reasoning and the case they have made and uh, go for the provisional attachment and later on there can be an extension in the attachment anyway for provisional attachment the initiating officers shall provisionally attach any property in the manner provided in part 2 and part 3 of chapter 16 of the income tax rules 2002 so basically that deals with how the properties are normally attached a notice is sent etc etc and that similar process would be used in the case of the provisional attachment for the benami properties or transactions section 8 perhaps one of the most interesting section because it deals with the confiscation of property under subsection 1 of section 25 god forbid the worst case scenario for anyone okay uh, by the way before we proceed do you guys think it's a just punishment to confiscate the property in addition to imposing a fine and prosecution with the jail term Usman Parvez is saying yes, okay. Muhammad Khan is saying yes. Muhammad Ijaz is saying no, okay. Um, okay, I'll take one yes and one no. So, um, can you open up uh, Muhammad Ijaz Saab's mic so we can speak with him? Assalamu alaikum, Ijaz Saab. Please get ready, unmute you from yourself so you can speak. Okay, we are getting yes, 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 Kailash, yes, Vasi, yes, Mojis, yes, Vasim, yes, Ishan, yes, okay. Uh, Mohammed Ijaz, uh, could you unmute yourself? Assalamu alaikum, sir. Wa alaikum assalam, Ijaz sahab, how are you? I'm fine, sir, what about you? I'm very well, thank you. Are you enjoying the session today? Uh, sir, exactly. How's the lock, lockdown treating you? 
staying at home or going to offices not sir yes uh, get, uh, not getting to office at home sir okay great so ijaz sir you have said no that this is not a just punishment why sir i think uh, the confiscation of the property and uh, just uh, imposing 25% of the uh, value of the property as a fine is not, is not uh, uh, as a fair punishment hmm. because uh, uh, this property might have been uh, got through tax evasions or money laundering or corruptions and if uh, just confiscating that money or uh, and uh, making up 25% uh, uh, fine uh, how can this be justify this oh. could be more than that because this this is only uh, the uh, money we are getting uh, the uh, public money getting back from that person so you want it to be yeah. even tougher but have you forgotten the yes. prosecution and jail term it's not just the confiscation of property and the fine there is also the provision of prosecution and jail term so three pronged yes sir uh, I, yes sir i uh, exactly know is the one to, one to seven years okay so what more you want to kill them <laughs> what 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 else you want I mean uh, the property sir, at, at, is at least, at least uh, the fine is being imposed and they are sent to the additional to the confiscation to the fine mm -hmm. so, go ahead uh, but I, I i guess uh, there should be a 100% uh, i suggest there should be a 100% fine in, uh, equal to the property value the confiscation of the property and uh, less uh, not less than 15 years of the uh jail okay okay thank you very if much there is, if there is there is no deterrent of the law uh, rules or uh, punishment uh, how, uh, how the people will doing uh, stop doing that okay fair enough that's a good perspective thank you ijaz sir okay uh so basically ijaz sir said no but he was a yes so he his no meant that this is too lenient um okay let's take the first one who answered live, uh, that's Usman Parvez. Uh, Nizam Sab, can you unmute Usman, please? Uh, Usman, you need to unmute yourself, please, and uh, we'll be able to ask the question. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Usman, how are you? Alhamdulillah, sir. Good. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you. Good to have you in the session today. Thank you, sir. It's are my pleasure. Enjoying? Yes, sir. I'm definitely enjoying this. Okay. Now, let's uh, come to the point, Usman. It's great you are in 